Welcome, good afternoon. Um, this is the third of um, our space and information domain webinar system. And for those who don't know me, I am Alex Altabelli. I'm a systems engineer at Becca Applied Technologies. Our usual host, Brendan Pett, is not able to join us today. Um, so it'll be me and Jess. Um, thanks for taking time out of your day to join us and our partner Space Base as we continue this series of webinars to inform, educate, and connect one another uh, with the broad goal of um, expanding the national space capacity um, and contribute to the wider international space effort. Following our first two webinars focused on setting the scene of New Zealand space, um, today we will hear from two New Zealand companies using and leveraging information from the space domain. Um, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Jess Tucker. Jess is an associate in systems engineering at Becca. She has over 20 years of experience in the aerospace domain, including support to defense, civil, and commercial programs in the US and across the world. I'm gonna hand it over to you, Jess. Thanks to everyone, to our panelists for, for coming to share their thoughts today and to our audience members for um, taking the time, making the time uh, to come participate um, in this uh, information exchange forum. Um, so, uh, this, as, as Alex has said, this is the third in our series of webinars in the information of the space um, and information domains. Today, we're going to hear from Orbica and Plant Tech, two New Zealand companies with technologies that make the most of information from the space domain. So to our audience, while our speakers are presenting, please feel free to submit questions via the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom screens. We'll hold questions until after both speakers have finished um, but I know that they'll be very interested in addressing the, uh, the questions you raise and the, and the comments that you share. Uh, so our first speaker is uh, Kurt Jansen from Orbica. Uh, Kurt is a geospatial entrepreneur and founder of Orbica, a Christchurch-based data intelligence company. He has a Bachelor of Science Honors in Geography from the University of Canterbury and a wealth of experience working for central government and private companies in New Zealand and, and in California in the US. Kurt is, a passionate, uh, is passionate about geography and has developed a talented team of disruptive thinkers who apply their cumulative experience and knowledge to solve tough problems with cost-effective location data-enabled solutions. Orbica leads the geospatial sector with investment in, into artificial intelligence and its ability to automate traditional business workflows to improve accuracy, efficiency, and value for clients. Please welcome Kurt Jansen. Uh, kia ora. Thanks, Jess. Uh, hello all. Uh, thanks for attending today. Right, uh, so as per introduction, uh, Kurt Jensen, we founded Orbica just over five years ago uh, and have been passionate in that integration of really next generation data analytics, of artificial intelligence, its integration with classic remote sensing and geospatial analytics, and uh, what we do with that in terms of solving new problems um, in the current decade in particular focused on uh, the relevancy to the grand challenges really that, that the, the world faces. Um, so this talk will cover um, both aerospace and space-based data, pixels, information, um, and how we get value out of it to answer some key, quick, key questions for uh, our, our audiences and also, you know, obviously our customers and the customer's customers. So I just want to ground our thinking here a little bit in terms of um, the role that geospatial as a broader bucket has to play in the current landscape. So these are two interesting excerpts I pulled out of uh, both the Norwegian and UK's geospatial strategy. Um, and again, it's, it's bound to those really big issues, right, that we'll challenge with this century in terms of climate change and its kick-on impacts and environmental challenges. Um, and human use of the planet, right, end of the day, um, geospatial is the digital representation of geography, of the human interaction with the physical resource uh, that we call planet Earth. Uh, the UK one there, the second one, uh, a great way to think about geospatial um, is just it's that unifying connection, right? So many of our businesses are siloed. We've got data in various systems and various buckets. Uh, that are available from open sources that we'll talk about today, but also the internal data that they've already invested into, right? Just think government. Um, there's so much data, much of it of which is open. How do we use advanced analytics, GeoAI, 
to find more value in these existing sunk investments of data. And um, geospatial, the location element of data, it's just the unifying glue, right? It's that common connection to tie it all together so we can sort of get value. One plus one equals 10. Uh, oops, next slide. Let's go slides. There we go. Uh, I quite like this diagram. It just sort of puts in perspective um, what we've been through the last couple of years, but also what's coming. And um, we hear a lot about climate change, obviously, and the potential impacts of that. Um, but, you know, beyond that is, um, you know, if we go too far here, it's that biodiversity collapse, uh, which is really going to be the issue. So it's just, it's bearing in mind where we sit now and the challenges coming. And now it's all about using data, digital technology to solve those challenges. Um, and that is the focus of today's talk. And now the thing here, I just wanted to, this is really interesting. Uh, I just wanted to get an update myself on um, kind of earth observation, right? So satellites in space, um, how many are there? Uh, so this is the numbers I could find as of August last year. This is changing all the time. And that's that democratization of the space sector that we're seeing, right? Um, our own rocket lab and SpaceX, of course, are shooting um, at times hundreds of CubeSats up at once uh, in the case of SpaceX. So again, really quite interesting to think through. A lot of what we'll talk about today is the optical imagery. Um, we are experimenting ourselves in-house with our, our customers around radar, so synthetic aperture radar from space, as well as hyper and multispectral imagery. Um, multi's been around for a long time, um, but hyper is now coming on stream. And I believe Ian's going to talk to some of that a bit later today as well in his talk. The two core things we focus on at Orbica are the insight stuff. So that's the main topic of today, you know, how we use analytics, AI, remote sensing, geospatial analytics, linked together with, with data, space data in this case, how we drive insights that are going to help actually solve the problems downstream for our customers. The other one is the more classic sort of geospatial engine, the integration of often the outputs or the derived results from the insights engine, how that is now mixed together with geospatial being that unifying link to other business data and business systems, wrap that up with narrative and context uh, in terms of the visual presentation of the data that actually drives decision making. And it's really important that um, we, you know you nail these two because it's all very well doing really wicked analytics and deep science stuff, but we still have to be able to speak to the masses, the decision makers, make it understandable to the wider masses so that action actually happens. Um, if we're not getting action, if we're not democratizing access to the insights, then we're failing. So that's the importance of bringing these two sort of elements together. Right, first case study I'm going to look at here is some work we've done here locally in Crusher City Council uh, for the region here. Um, the challenge we were set to do here was how do we identify in high resolution a data asset product that represents trees, trees across the whole of Crusher City Council? Now we've used, in this case, aerial captured data. Um, there's about 800 images. Each image for one time snap is about 15.8 uh, million pixels. So we're talking billions upon billions of, of pixels to analyze and try and get automation to derive the results out of. The downstream impacts of this is operational management um, and better enhancing the ops of the arborist nature of the arborist function of Crescent City Council. And then it spawns off to some interesting use cases, which I'm quite excited about around understanding equality of access to shade and green space. Uh, and this is popping up all around the world, particularly as climates are warming. Um, shade that provided by trees and canopy cover is a key determinant in terms of the healthiness and the resiliency of a city to be able to withstand increasing temperatures. So understanding its spatial distribution uh, across the city is vital for the investments into trees and vegetation going forward. Um, and what you're finding is there's a, there's a linkage between how rich uh, or, or conversely how deprived the suburb is and its lack of trees and canopy cover. Um, so just in the Christchurch context, if you think out east towards the beaches, the more deprived parts of town, there's a lot less canopy cover than there is in the likes of Fendelfin or Kashmir, some, some of the more traditional older suburbs um, of Christchurch. So understanding this allows the investment choices that the likes of city councils are having to make um, be optimized with data and evidence. So if we just jump to the next slide, if it's going to go for me here. 
There we go. So this is a typical sort of uh, what we call a GeoAI pipeline. Um, so simplistically, this is how we do many of our projects. So there's imagery and data coming in. Um, we work with the SME data experts or domain experts in council or in our customers um, who know everything about trees, for instance, and we create a model. And that model is obviously about identifying and counting the number of trees. Um, we then go through post-processing functions, we extract the features, and then it's added into the more classic geospatial tooling, which allow us to integrate it with other data, in this case, LIDAR, to also find out the heights of trees and the canopy structure. Um, at that point, you're then visualizing the outputs. Now, this is an iterated process, right? So the model may do 80% on its first sort of go round, and we might be trying to hit a target accuracy precision of 90%. So that's the importance of the human in the loop. The human comes in with the domain expertise, and we'll look at the results, the intermediary results of the model. They will put in their domain expertise. We retrain or retweak the model, which then picks up the learnings from that, that loop, that SME knowledge, and the model gets better. So next run, it's 82%, then 84%, 86%. And we just run that process um, as often as we need to, to achieve the sorts of expectations we've set together with the customer. So this is a very typical sort of analytical pipeline, really, of how most of our insights work operates within the business. Let's go slides. Sorry, guys, the slides just take a little bit of time to move through here. Right, so what we're now looking at here is the extracted in data product. So you look on the left-hand side, you go, holy moly, that's 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 a mess. Um, but when you zoom in, this is a full automation of, of tree canopy extraction now that's happening across the pixels. Uh, this is RGB only, so red, green, blue. There's no sort of multi-spectral infrared bands going on here. It's just simply three band. Um, this gives you that level of delineation that we uh, can start to pull out. Now, the interesting thing here is, to digitize that by hand, it's just, it takes so much time. And of course, it's full of human error as well. Um, we've got this algorithm down, it can pump out 16 million pixels in about 10 seconds to that fully extracted delineated output we're seeing on the right hand side. Of course, that allows us now to run it for the entirety of the city, uh, 8,000 tiles uh, or there or thereabouts. If we then look at the next element of this project, if my slide's going to move for me, I might use that button instead. Um, there's interesting features, right? So a lot of AI and analytics in the in the world of sort of computer vision and what we're looking at here. Um, you, you know, it's, it, the hedges look very different to the computer uh, or a new plantation like we're seeing on the left than a classic sort of what we're looking at there in the middle of Hagley Park with mature trees. So it's really important that we're working with the domain experts to digitize the right training data that as a sample represents that area we're looking at. Uh, it's really easy for this to go wrong. Um, if you feed the wrong data in at the start and the wrong insights into the machine, it's going to give you biased results. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in the next case study. Uh, so these are the key features that we're trying to pull out. And, and uh, you know, at the bottom there, I just want to, avoiding shadowed areas is really quite interesting, right? If you think about tree canopy and the angle of the sun when the, when the image was taken, uh, you can get a lot of shade going on. And so that's a, that's a common issue with AI, GeoAI, computer vision, remote sensing. So again, techniques to think through, again, the, the model design to avoid as much issue in terms of shadow as possible, but also, again, the types of training data and how the training data is created to, again, alleviate and mitigate that issue is really important. So the next phase of this, we've extracted, as you saw, all the trees, all the canopy cover. Um, now, a tree is a tree... Uh, or the definition of a tree is different depending on who you talk to. So in this case, the 3.5 meters high or, or greater and greater than one and a half meters uh, squared of canopy, that defines a tree in the context of um, Crusher City Council for what they're trying to achieve here. So we then bring over the LIDAR information, which is height and elevation information. Uh, we can calculate the difference or the height of a tree based on the ground height and the top of the canopy height, and that becomes the height of the tree. And that then allows us to um, filter those results based on the AI model we saw earlier to now get a really comprehensive view of what canopy topology looks like across the whole city. So that starts to give you a feel 
Um, we can tell you the highest tree in Canterbury or in, in uh, Hagley Park is 51 meters high, uh, based on the latest LIDAR data, uh, which is pretty interesting insight for folks. Cool. So that was that project. We then spun off and we've done some work here uh, with our partners over in Australia, uh, Frontier SI, um, which has been a great project. And recently it's just won an award um, looking at how we create a tree ledger. So basically a benchmark product to work with those guys for the tree count and canopy cover for the whole of Victoria. Um, and it's got great use cases, you know, with a benchmark like this, you can start to establish a base zone, essentially carbon sink, carbon sequestration um, benchmark. And then going forward, we're hearing all these initiatives about let's plant a million trees, a billion trees, all this stuff. This allows that benchmark to now measure yourself off. Um, but of course, because it's geospatial, we can start to identify the areas we should look at first, the ones that um, have little canopy cover and should have more. So it allows you to proactively manage and monitor and design your implementations going forward for bank for buck uh, for various community measures and KPIs that might be wrapped around it. So again, really cool, very similar to what we just did. And that's the joy of this, right? With, with a bit of transfer learning, pixels are pixels, geography is geography. Um, it allows us to craft and tweak a model to work in different environments. Of course, the model that might be running 90% in Christchurch may only run off the back at 78% in Victoria. And so that's that transfer learning, working with domain experts in Australia, because the trees are a bit different, the topography is a bit different, um, and then transfer learning, i.e. human in the loop on that model, improve it up to the required accuracy needed for Victoria say. So that, that's a typical sort of mechanism of how a project would work and flow through the office. There's two core products here. There's a tree count. So on the left-hand side, that's a bit hard to see, but each tree has a bounding box and it's being identified by the model as I count one tree. The other side is the segmentation or the segmented product, which is more like what we're looking at with Christchurch, which is actually delineate the canopy cover or the vegetation cover, please, and draw that exact outline. So the other two, two sort of core products that spin out of this model. And again, within the urban regions there, um, you can see what's going on. Right, another one here to touch on briefly um, is now using Sentinel-2 data. So this is um, from the ESA satellites, um, the European Space Agency satellites. This is multispectral. Now, what we're craft to do here it was a bit of exploratory work to understand if we could use data available and well curated in terms of training data linked to the S2 data from the states, if we could run and do some transfer learning to see how well that would work in the New Zealand context. And that's what we've achieved here. Um, so again, similar pipeline to what you saw before in terms of the process and the methodology. Uh, the innovation we're sort of bringing here is if you could think about orchards and, and whatnot, horticulture were the main, uh, uh, what we're trying to extract here in terms of land cover. Um, they change throughout the year, of course. The ESA satellites, the Sentinel-2 satellites are coming over roughly every five days. Um, so pending cloud cover, there's lots of temporal time snaps. Now, an orchard looks very different when it's in harvest season versus sort of end of winter, for instance. Uh, and so being able to build a model that has snapshots of time, so the temporal element to the data pixels was really important for this. And it greatly improved the outcome of the results. So one thing to touch on here, and we talked about it briefly before, is just the idea of your training data and how that links into the accuracy of your results. So straight off the bat here, the training data is the stuff on the left-hand side. You'll note that pasture and ground cover, or bare ground, is by far the highest number of training pixels, essentially. Um, so that initially creates bias in the model. So it's really important that we understand that apples and vineyards, for instance, are what we're trying to look for, but they only represented together you know, just over 4% of the actual trained data. So you need to be able to build in that statistical methodologies there um, to be able to uh, not over and under sample the results, right? Because um, it can have, if you just threw that at it, it's gonna find a lot of ground, but it's not gonna find a lot of apples. So it's just understanding at that level, um, again, the impact on your training data and, and what that can create in terms of downstream impact. So on the left-hand side is just a mask, single color of the training data we had. On the right-hand side um, is a multi-temple CNN, so a multi-temple deep learning model. So that's those various time slices we talk to of the satellite imagery. So you can see the accuracy of pure prediction against the mask compared to the mask itself. Uh, this was running circa 90% um, over there in terms of pixel by pixel accuracy. 
Um, now, applying that over here uh, with the no New Zealand training data was really interesting. So again, the New Zealand mask um, and then the deep neural network. So uh, this is with no temporal information. So the key thing to take away from this is the noise that's coming out, right? So the white here is being predicted as something it's not. So they're false positives. So if we then look at the multi-temporal element of that, um, that's now on the right-hand side, the temporal CNN. So you can see how much cleaner that result is by taking multiple time slices within the same model. So that's running at roughly 80% accuracy at, at present. And it proved the point quite well, which is the point of this exercise. So again, freely available data, lots of downstream use, end use cases, and Ian will talk to some as well. Um, it's just about the innovation on the processing of the pixels and figuring out the um, also the cost implications of training, because we're talking about often terabytes of data here. So there's a big compute element to this as well. The last case study I'll touch on briefly uh, was a really interesting one, looking at and trying to understand how we can use high resolution satellite information uh, to do post-disaster response um, information, basically. How, so a big flood comes in, big storm comes in, a typhoon comes in. How do we use satellites to identify where the roads have been cut off, where they're flooded, where they've been washed away? And how does that then impact the information the intelligence experts have about identifying how do we evacuate that area? How do we get supplies into the area? All this sort of stuff. Um, so very much an operational view on this. So we used a mix here of um, some commercially available, high resolution, high temporal availability satellite data um, and open street map um, as the source of the truth or the ground truthing of where the roads actually are. And essentially what it means is automatically we can calculate a road damage score. We can look at how much of the road is damaged. So you can see the GIS engine down the bottom via classic sort of GIS analysis after the AI has done its work. Uh, which allows us to basically pull out and differentiate, hey, this road is impassable, this road is down to one lane, this road has two kilometres out, and that's very different from an engineering perspective than if it's um, 50 metres is out, right? So the implications around that about, you know, we can actually deal with a temporary bridge to deal with a 50 metre one, but we can't deal with a two kilometre one in the, next, in the next month or two, right? That's going to take a lot more engineering effort. So that's the sort of downstream intelligence um, that allows the analysts to do their job really well. And again, some actual images here that start to look at the identification of flooded roads, not flooded roads. Um, and you can see the resulting images on the sides there. So again, the automation of getting intelligence in the hands of the analyst is really important rather than just data uh, that they have to trawl through uh, themselves. So these are the outputs and I'm just running out of time here. So what I'll do is just flick to the end. Um, and just, I'll just leave this up for a bit. So some stuff for everybody maybe to think about around some questions is um, what's coming down the pipe in terms of technology and also use cases, right? Um, they are the two considerations here, technology and data, use cases, intersection of both is how we're going to innovate and help solve some of the world's challenges, some of the world's problems. Uh, thanks very much for your time. Thanks, Kurt. Um, I, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm a systems engineer and requirements are my bread and butter. I was quite pleased to see that there's a technical definition of a tree. <laughs> Anyhow, um, thank you again, Kurt, for your, for your uh, presentation today. Um, again, we'd like to invite attendees to submit questions via the Q&A function down at the bottom of your Zoom screens. Both speakers will have a chance to answer questions after our next presentation from Plant Tech. Uh, Dr. Ian Yule is the research director for Plant Tech Research. He is an experienced leading researcher with a strong track record of working in higher education, conducting industry relevant research and commercialization. Skilled in precision agriculture and agritech, Ian has spent the bulk of his recent career working on contract research in the areas of precision agriculture, agrotechnology and remote sensing with a particular focus on hyperspectral imaging and image analysis. Please welcome Dr. Ian Yule. Hey, thanks very much. We got a right. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay. Oh, sorry, I've got now I've got control. I think. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, that was a really interesting presentation, Kurt. Thanks for thanks for that. A lot of touch points, I think, with the, the type of thing that I, I want to discuss as well. So 
I'm te prob probably technically the least qualified person in our organization to talk about this, but I just want to give you a, a general view. My, my function is research director. And uh, you can imagine that some of the problems that Kurt talked about were, were working in a biological system, highly variable, the chance for bias, the training, training, of, uh, training of models is, is really key. Um, and a lot of the things that uh, Kurt was talking about really, really hit a, cur a chord with me. So I've got a list of people here that are involved as myself, Reddy Pulanagari, Ishfan, Haju, Mohammed, uh, Dagan Shorn, Alvaro Orsi, are all contributed to the, the work that's been presented here today. And I've just put those emails up and you're quite welcome to, to, um, to get in touch with them. So um, let's see if I can... Um, so really, um, we're a, a data science organization, and, and, we, and Kurt also mentioned artificial intelligence, but that's our key thing is around artificial intelligence, machine learning to high value plant based systems. So we're about a team of 20 staff now, really got the, that team going about two and a half years ago. Re and again, put into three groups. Um, remote sensing, proximal or close range sensing. We do a lot of work with vision systems and um, won't be talking about that today. And we also do quite a bit of work in data analytics and, and some new methodologies trying to exploit the AI, machine learning, et cetera, in that sphere. Um, and um, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, so some of the challenges is, is to create that deep science capability um, rather than we're not a, a kind of a jobbing shop for companies to hire people in. We want to develop uh, deeper science as well. And that's and that's been a, a challenge. Um, then meet industry set objectives. So like if I was working in a university, if I could justify my curiosity and, and, and so on, I could you know probably get funding to do it. That's not how plant tech operates we're around trying to answer industry problems so three main areas of work member projects where we work with members or, or we're formerly shareholders contestable funding we enter into contestable funding and we have also have a research strategy which is like a pump primer and it's some of the activities in that that i'll talk about today that's creating the, the research pipeline gives you an indication of where we're going in the future so what are the industry challenges? Labor, that's probably more um, easily dealt with in terms of proximal sensing and robotics, the sorts of systems that we're, we're talking about there, but really echoing uh, what Kurt was saying around global climate change, its effects on the pri our primary industry. And one of the things that you'll see is, is a, an emphasis on detecting stress, whether that's water stress, disease stress, uh, you know any other uh, type of, of stress on a plant that's that those are some of the activities that we've been involved in so it's really how can we ch uh, close the yield gap so the yield gap is the difference between what we can actually grow and what we do grow so th there is actually always a big difference and how can we make efficient use of, of fertilizers and, and our uh, materials and reducing um, carbon emissions is also important so I'll just sorry I'll just show you some um, some examples some platforms we'll, we'll talk a bit about nutrient mapping potential hybrid radiative transfer models and, and the use of SAR so that was the, the topics that I wanted to do so spectral imaging 101 I'm sure most of you know um, quite a bit about this uh, already RGB imagery can have its uses it's, it's usually given at a fairly fine resolution multi-spectral Fantastic for uh, in the near infrared for vegetation, looking at healthy or, or unhealthy vegetation. We can use that um, through mainly through satellite information. I'll show you a couple of examples. And then hyperspectral um, information. This is where we're using mainly airborne um, imagery. We're using a camera that's got 364 wave bands. And what it's doing is, is really giving you a, a, a a spectral signature so you can see the rgb part of the spectrum you can see the near infrared you can see some of the water bands etc further on in the short wave um, and there's a lot of information that's that's in, that are that are come within that that signature so you can see there we've tried to illustrate with four 
attributes, buildings, kiwi fruit, avocado, and, and road. And you can see the, the spectral signature, or you can see the, the, the signals that you would get from a multispectral um, system. So how do we use these? Here's a typical example. We, we do use SkySat, we use um, Sentinel, uh, just to classify out. This is looking at kiwi fruit orchards. Uh, we can go further. We've, um, this is just using some other imagery, looking to identify both avocado, kiwi fruit. Uh, kiwi fruit, we think we can make a pretty good job of um, determining whether it's gold kiwi fruit or, or green. So we can become, you know, we're getting better at, at determining different varieties within the same plant uh, species, for example. So these are just some examples that we've been uh, doing. With the hyperspectral, one of the key focuses that we've had for the last couple of years, and this is born from some of the precision agriculture work that I did previously, uh, is looking at foliar nutrient distribution. And um, you know, we can basically, I'll explain in, in a second how we can how we can do that type of work. So I'll just talk a little bit about the airborne um, uh, system that we run. Uh, in an aircraft, we fly at 2,000 feet. You can see a flight plan there. We get the, the raw data strips. And from that, as Kurt described, we're trying to get derived products. So it may be derived products around some form of stress, whether it's dry matter, it might be canopy nutrients. And, and really, we're interested in predicting yield potential. And some of that work is, is still obviously ongoing. Um, here's a, I think it's a 12,000 hectare survey. Um, so it's uh, quite a large um, survey that we can do. And, and that's, that would take us a, a best part of a day. So our, our current um, uh, research strategy we're doing, looking at about a 6,000 hectare block of um, kiwi fruit in, in Tepuki. We're looking at a similar area in the Hawke's Bay um, for apples and um, a mixture in Kari Kari of avocado and, and uh, kiwi fruit. So we're trying to work with most of the industries. We've got a lot of interaction with the companies, the main apple growers, the main kiwi fruit growers or pack houses and so on. So we're actively engaged with those, um, those groups. And um, as Kurt mentioned about the billions of pieces of information, I think there's something like 91 billion pieces of information in these uh, or data points in these uh, surveys. So what we're trying to do or what we initially were trying to do was to give each grower, when they send a, a sample to the lab, they often send foliar samples to the lab and they get a report back like this. And we're basically trying to do that for the whole industry. So whereas previously, some of the advantages of this approach is that previously people would be do a, a small limited field trial, what we're trying to, and then try and extrapolate the results to the rest of the industry, what we're trying to do is get results for the whole of the industry and then work down and use data analytics to, to discover what are the relationships, et cetera, et cetera. What are the key things driving yield? And we're still sort of somewhat in that process working with companies to do that. So here's a typical example. This is the Tepuki. We have to ground truth. And again, Kurt talked about ground truthing data, about sampling, about um, calibration, validation, independent validation. So these are um, just some ideas of what we can do in terms of predicting nitrogen, for example. We can make a pretty good job of predicting nitrogen, con foliar nitrogen content from the air. You can see quite a good um, correlation there. This was stuff that was done last year. Phosphorus, potassium, calcium, iron. A lot of these things we can we can begin to derive the relationship. So we can build up a really good picture of, of what's happening um, in orchards. And what we're trying to do then is to get, um, you know, this is a regional scale, this is Kari Kari, um, but can we do this at a, a national scale? And can we do it for all crops, not just kiwi fruit? So this is kiwi fruit at a certain point in time. And we've um, worked out the, the nitrogen content of the canopy um, in this image. Sorry, it seems a bit jumpy on the system, or it is here anyway. And the yellow areas are areas of higher nitrogen content, the blue areas are, are, are um, lower. So this is nitrogen content in the foliage. And that's important to, for us working out nutrient applications and so on and trying to minimize our cost and minimize environmental impact. So you can see that's just why he beach up in the 
So I think the point here is that we can do things at scale and we can get some pretty good useful information for the whole of the industry. So uh, one thing I did want to just briefly mention, uh, Mohammed is working in, um, on this idea of, of um, hybrid models. So a lot of that type of stuff that I've just demonstrated, really building empirical relationships, building empirical models. We can also use physical models. And uh, there's a lot of um, talk around radiative transfer models. And what, from his initial work, what we found is that we can improve the quality of prediction uh, we can reduce the number of um, samples that we need to train um, uh, an image. And we think in terms of transferability from different locations, rather like Kurt was talking about, we again, we think that we can reduce that workload and we can also reduce uncertainty. So there are a number of advantages. And I guess many of you in the audience might have heard, have heard of um, physical models like pros, uh, ProSale, Prospect, other other modeling systems. So if you want to find more about that, then maybe talk to Mohammed. Um, just, uh, just a little bit about combining LIDAR, hyperspectral. This is some work that was done, led by Al Alvaro Orsi. Um, and it's got a number of collaborators, including Plant and Food, University of Melbourne, Eurofins, Durham University in the UK. So um, you all, I think most of you will realize about uh, um, how vegetation re responds to sunlight. And what we're trying to do here is to look at stress. And we're trying to look at a stress reaction that's related to fluorescence. Um, and so we know that the leaf optical properties vary with wavelength, and it's dependent on those biophysical and biochemical parameters. And we know that chlorophyll um, fluorescence can be a signal for stress, but we also know that it's a very small part of that signal. So the work that he's doing is trying to separate out what, you know, what is that information telling, can we get to that information? And so we've had some, again, we've had some success in being able to do that. And there's a map there of um, where we think the, the yellower areas or the lighter areas are areas where we think there is more stress um, in that orchard. So again, it's, it's, it's really focusing on that stress and, and of the crop. And we're using a number of, sorry, a number of different devices. Uh, we use LIDAR we, and we use some aerial LIDAR, uh, airborne LIDAR as well. And Alec, uh, sorry, Kurt mentioned around um, tree. We've done quite a bit of work on uh, getting, um, measuring trees and also using the hyperspectral in conjunction with that to be very particular about identifying the species of the tree. So we can build a pretty rich picture of, of your environment. And these are just some of the devices that we use in the orchard. So we think that there is uh, obviously there's some future in this and that sun induced um, fluorescence we actually think is a, an early sign of stress and that we are getting increasingly confident about being able to, to predict that. So another area of interest is synthetic aperture radar. And this is a presentation that was really, it's a project that's uh, we've had with the Nagtokarangi Trust and Ricardo, a, com a data company around us. Uh, it was part of the National Science Challenges, Our Land and Water, and Ishvan led this project. And what we're trying to do here is to look at, uh, can we use SAR data? And again, it's about identifying stress. Can we identify water stress in a, a, a kiwi fruit crop? to look at sustainable management. And you know, we know there's increasing pressure on growers, but really it's about can we measure leaf content, uh, water content, or can we represent leaf water content at a larger scale than we can do with spot measurement of soil, for example, which is a conventional method that we use at the moment. So these are the parties, these are the locations. We see Tauranga Harbor here, and I took a Rangi Trust that's actually quite close to the airport. The, the, the orchards that we're using in Ricardo are based in, in Tupuki. So we're using a number of different me methods of measurement. We're looking at the, obviously the synthetic aperture radar. Uh, we're trying to measure leaf water content. We're also measuring soil moisture content and we're monitoring rainfall and irrigation. And there's a quite a large presentation on this, this project, but if you want to find more then maybe talk to um, um, Ishvan. So, 
Again, you'll be aware that um, around the SAR and the Sentinel um, uh, satellites and how they operate, the fact that um, SAR data can, you know, you can collect SAR. It's, a, it's got its own energy source you can record through clouds. It's not like an optical system purely based on, on reflectance. So you'll also, some of you will be aware that uh, this is what an image might come out looking like in terms of uh, once we've collected some of that data, but you'll also be aware that the uh, Sentinel-1B has been out of service. Now, at first we were pretty disappointed about that, but then we were, got the opportunity to, to use another uh, satellite, ISAR, um, SAR, and you can see that the definition has actually has improved. So the whole purpose of this, uh, of this project is really to to be able to try and predict leaf water level content at a block level um, from the um, from the SAR imagery. And okay, I haven't gone into any detail, but if you want to do it, so how successful have we been? So here's the here's the block. You can see the scale there, the, the leaf water content from 81 down to about 70. I think once you get to about 68, the um, the then you're in significant high, very significant water stress. The areas are actually different because one is green kiwi fruit and one is, is gold. And we found that there is actually a difference in the water content of the leaves from the get go. So there are some phenological differences in the plant. So here we can track through time and we can see how the, the moisture level is tracking in that crop through, through time. Okay. So again, it's, it's trying to get information for the grower um, that uh, will be, and again, we can do that on a national or a, or a regional scale. So it just shows, I think, the potential of these um, sorts of um, applications. So that was really what I wanted to, to emphasize to you that, um, you know, we're, we're working in some of these areas, we've got to make them be able to work faster. Uh, we've got to make them as accurate as we can. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a bit possessed when it comes to trying to get things as accurate as we can, because I think we often take shortcuts, but we can you know, improve and, and really try and improve the value of, of what we can get from remote sensing. But as I say, hopefully these um, examples just show you some of the power of what can be done. I would think in 12 months time, we'll be in a better position to look at, you know, can we predict? It's really about prediction then rather than reactive things. So can we predict what's going to happen in the kiwi fruit? Can we predict what's going to happen? So in terms of um, uh, moisture stress, can we predict in terms of growth? Can we predict in terms of yield and so on? So these are some of the important things that we need to do. And can we use that information to help growers to guide them to, to close that yield gap? So that's really the main point that I want, wanted to make to you. So I'll end it there and, and ask for questions. Or oh, sorry, but I see we're going to do the question session. Okay, thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Ian. Yep. All right, so we did, we have had a number of questions come through um, directed at Kurt for the most part, who has answered many of them um, uh, typed answers. Uh, there are there's at least one or two that um, uh, he's indicated he'd like to answer um, himself, um, and so we'll go to questions from the audience first. So um, for Kurt. Um, there's a lot of amazing satellite infrastructure and data already out there and on the way in terms of aerospace should we, in your opinion, folk in Aotearoa focus on hardware solutions, or can we make better use of AI, machine learning, deep learning, or is it going to be a combination of both? Uh, yeah, yeah, good, good question. Um, I, I think it's a combination of both, but I think there's a lot of untapped potential for New Zealand to uh, be in the data analytics space. So just, I mean, you've seen Orbica as well as Ian's, uh, you know, plant tech there down in the downstream data analytics space for the most part, we're not building drones or satellites. Um, and saying that though, it's always, where's the gaps, right? So a Kia Aerospace down here, they're doing stratospheric uh, stuff, right? So that sort of mid zone between classic aerial assessment up in the air and space, which is pretty interesting, right? Uh, because you'll be able to get um, sort of a 10 centimeter type resolution product um, instead of a 30, 35 centimeter is the best product we can get out of space. So yeah, don't know. The other side of it is cost, right? Um, hardware is expensive, particularly when you get to launch it. So 
Yep. Don't know. Um, it's a good discussion point. I think a good one for a panel at some point somewhere. Thanks, Kurt. Um, uh, and there's been one raised specifically. Hey. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Do you want me to answer it live? Uh, sure. Yep. Um, so the, the question really was um, the what I've described was around kiwi fruit mainly, avocado, et cetera. And um, is it being investigated in other agricultural systems such as dairy pastures, et cetera? So a lot of um, my team actually come from the sort of precision agricultural area. So yes, some of that has been wor uh, worked on. Ishfan, for example, did his, his PhD in hill country in New Zealand and it was uh, looking at those sorts of things. So yes, the answer is yes, we, um, um, can do it for other agricultural systems. I think part, to me, if I can maybe expand on that, part of the problem is we all see value or we see some value in remote sense data, but it, you know, if you were trying to do this for a whole region or a whole, whole country, then clearly there's a significant cost. And it's, it's that old classic of who pays. You know, everybody's busily pointing at each other as to who should pay. And I think that's one of the things that we've tried to address through working with the companies like the pack houses, et cetera, in the kiwi fruit industry is to try, we've got to demonstrate value to them. So there's no good as a bunch of scientists saying, hey, you could do this, you could do that. We've actually got to demonstrate the value to them. And I think that's one of the big difficulties with the remote sensing is people can see some value, but we've, and, you know, we're working in high value systems. And we've got to be able to demonstrate the significant value and then hopefully we can get buy in. But someone has got to take the step. And I think the whole there's a bit question there about data ownership and displaying other people's data. That whole thing is really important in, a, in an industry that's quite structured. So kiwi fruit, you have an exporter who's uh, marketing the whole crop. You have various um, pack houses and then you have individual growers uh, as well. So you have got different layers of data. And I think getting agreement about how we share data, who pays for what is also is, is key to, to getting some of these things put in place. Uh, thanks, Ian. There are uh, a couple of questions here that look like they're um, related. Um, one asking um, for both, what are the challenges of bringing this sort of technology to non-traditional users of space? Um, and the other asking the corresponding question, how do these applications differ from current models? Um, do the benefits outweigh the costs of implementing the, this kind of high-tech tooling? Um, Kurt, would you like to answer first? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, as I described a bit earlier, right, it's not just the, the smart sort of PhDs doing the analytics, it's how we get the insights of the hands of end users. So the wife side of the family at Christmas, our farmers up in Horrorada, and we're often talking about uh, the lack of technology they use on the farm because Mr. Farmer doesn't know which of his 27 apps he should use right um it's too hard it's too fragmented so again like all technology we need to think about the end end user and often that doesn't come up enough in the conversations of technologists and it's something we are always talking about at orbica and trying to get better at um we often think you know if we think about airbnb lime the simplicity of access the frictionless experience to get what you want is just it's so easy how do we bring that experience to the world of sort of enterprise big data analytics. Um, and, and that's a, a bit of a challenge I pose, I guess, in terms of thinking around this stuff. Um, Ian, you must come across this a bunch as well. The other yep. thing here, maybe Ian, that I was gonna ask is um, setting customer expectations because often people think it's magic and I'm gonna get 99.9%. .9%. Um, yep. Nothing is 99.9%. .9%. So again, that's interesting to me too, to think through. Well, I've just been spending half my morning explaining to someone why it won't be 99.9%. <laughs> um, so it's, you know, it's interesting that you say that just in terms of expectation, um, setting people's uh, having realistic expectation. One of the things that we've, um, so last year, if you like, what we were working with, we, we thought there's not enough remote sense data. There wasn't it was a you know in, in terms of our industry the the quality of some of the information wasn't that good the quality of the ground truth information was pretty terrible so we've tried to improve a lot of that what metadata just get better consistency and i think what we're trying to do now is with our research strategy is that okay 
if I'm in the orchard and I'm, or if I'm in my farm in Hororata and I look at something, I, I make an observation and I can make a decision pretty quickly. The problem is that we need to speed up the process or we need to anticipate the process so that if someone's out in an orchard, they've already got the information around, well, what is the, you know, what's the irrigation going to be today? Because I think all too often we're, we're, there's a lag. And I think it's a combination of using. So one of the things we're looking at is, is probably the same as used is sort of data streaming. How can we use these different techniques to, it's a, it's a thing like, you know, you've, you've got a temporal um, image. So say it might be a, something like a SAR uh, data coming in. We're not, that, was, that was Thursday, today is today. There's another image coming tomorrow, but where I'm in the orchard today, where am I? So I need something to bridge that gap. So those are some of the sorts of things that we're looking at now is how can we really get good, valuable information, accurate information to growers really, really quickly. And that's kind of a focus that uh, that we're kind of a bit of a crusade that we're on this year, yeah. Uh, that is really cool, Ian. One thing I should do a slide at some point. If you think of Venn diagram between, between cost, time to output, and accuracy, pick pick two of them, right? And so it's, it's being able to think about that from a customer lens perspective and going, I want the results now from data I collected an hour ago. I will yep. sacrifice some accuracy to achieve that. Mm -hmm. So again, just thinking through those challenges is interesting. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. There, there was actually a question raised in the general chat, sort of a generic or a broad startup question. What do you wish you knew or had at the start of your startup journey? <laughs> uh, oh, there's so many things. I could spend hours on that. <laughs> um, no, I mean, the thing is, it's all in hindsight, right? I guess going back, I wish I had the focus I've now got, but then it's the last five years of experience that's kind of landed me to the focus I've now got for Orbica, right? So it's kind of it's kind of difficult, chicken and egg, to be honest. Um, yeah, there's so many angles to look at that, that from a money lens, from a commercial lens, from a people culture lens. <laughs> um, it's a big question. Okay. <laughs> Um, but again, go on the journey. There's no other way like learning stuff than just putting, just getting out there and doing it. I don't know what you think, Ian, but once you open up a shop, um, there's no other way to learn the stuff you learn than yeah. experiencing it. And I think, I guess, from my point of view, one of the things is we're a data science organization, but there were two non-data scientists that tried to put it together, if you like. And um, that, that's been quite a challenge. And, but it's also getting other people to recognize the value of data science. I think that was, if you like my previous career, that was kind of a bit of a frustration. I could see that we were, I was coming from the point of view of a domain expertise. And then we were making these slow incremental changes into machine learning, into these other techniques, but always realizing that we were never quite making that big step. And I think, um, you know, I wish I'd been involved in something a bit earlier that made that big step because I think it's um, it's got the potential to to add a lot of value. But I think we need probably a, again better links with domain experts, and and that requires a, a bit of a change in how the re the whole research thing is organised in New Zealand. I think we would tend to be a wee bit patch protective, but. Um, yeah, it's been, a, it's been an interesting uh, journey. And there were a few people who said to me when I left the university, why on earth did you do that at your time of life? But it's been, a, it's been an absolute blast and I've, I've learned so much. But um, yeah, it's from a personal point of view, it's been great. But uh, I think it's just the horizons that I see, you know, that, that these people are actually capable of fulfilling what I had in terms of, my, you know, imagining what solutions might be that I feel a lot more empowered that I think we'll, we'll get there. I think that's one of the key messages for me and just encourages you to keep working at it. I think a bit like, a bit like you, Kurt, I'm pretty enthusiastic about these things. <laughs> awesome. Well, I think um, that brings us to the end of our questions. So uh, thanks to you both, uh, Kurt and Ian, for sharing your insights with us today. And, and thank you to our audience for your time and attention. Um, 
we've got contact information for both of our speakers as well as for the uh, space and information domain webinar team. Um, our next webinar will be in April, where we'll hear from two uh, space startups, um, Zeno Astronautics and uh, extraterrestrial, extraterrestrial power. So save the date information uh, will come out soon via social and email for uh, attendees to this. If you've got any questions or comments or feedback, if you'd like to suggest or request a topic or if you or if you yourself are a speaker and you'd like to get um, get your message out, uh, please get in touch. We'd really like to hear from you. So again, thank you very much for everyone for your time and attention. Thanks to our speakers uh, for sharing their thoughts with us and we'll see you next time.